Well, take your copy of God's Word and turn again to the book of Galatians. We are in Galatians chapter 3 today. Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 25. Galatians 3, 10 through 25. Well, you haven't lived uh, until you've lived somewhere in the south and you walk into a dark room and you turn the light on and the big old cockroaches go scrambling. I mean, (laughs) in the west, you know, you can get roaches, but you have to work a little harder to get them. Um, I think now for, we've lived outside of the south for 26 years. My oldest is 28. I think for 26 years, I've been telling my kids, if you ever live in the south, you're going to have to, you can't leave a speck of that or you're going to draw roaches. But you just, I mean, that's a a startling thing. If you've never experienced it, I I hope you get to do that. Roaches, (laughs) roaches that look like you could ride them. Uh, I mean, whoo. Well, you know, there's a simple answer, of course, and that's just to leave the lights off. You just don't turn the lights on. And no, that's not the answer. The problem is there either way. But the light just exposes the issue that needs to be fixed. That's what we're looking at today with Paul in Galatians chapter 3. The problem is there, but God wants us to see the fix. Read with me a little bit longer passage today. Beginning in verse 10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident for, quote, the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in human relations, in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I'm saying is this. The law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. And therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Well, we've got a lot of ground to cover uh, today and a lot of wonderful bedrock ground to be reminded of and perhaps some for the first time to think about some of the things that the Lord is saying. The first thing that I would say that Paul is saying to me and to you today is he's pointing out the utter impossibility of being made just by the works of the law. 
here in these first two verses, verses 10 and 11. He begins, for as many as are under the, uh, of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Paul says, let me help you out here. If you have any notion that you can be good enough to be right with God, if you have any thought that you can obey the law, obey God, follow the scripture, be religious, do anything in such a way that you may gain entrance into heaven, gain right standing before God. Paul says, you have to decide, Galatians and Sandians, you got to decide one or the other. But he says, let me tell you, if you choose the route of thinking that you can keep the law, that you can be so good as to gain heaven. Let me just cut to the chase, Paul says. Spoiler alert here, you failed. If you want to go the route of the law, and again, he's not, as we'll see, he's not condemning the law, not at all. But he's just saying, if you want to go the route of trying to keep the law to make God pleased and make you uh, gain entrance into heaven, let me just tell you, forget it. Give up. Because the scripture says, you've got to keep all of it, and no one ever besides Jesus has or will do that. I'm going to make you an omelet, Paul says. I'm going to use 11 beautiful fresh eggs, and I'm going to use one very rotten egg. But I'm going to mix them all together. Who's hungry? And the scripture tells us in numerous places, you can keep 99.9% of the law, which you can't. But if you could, that 0.1% is all it takes to have you condemned. James tells us that. He says, if you keep every bit of the law, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point is guilty of it all. Some of us went door to door here in the neighborhood yesterday. I encourage you, we'll be doing that again in a few weeks, next month. No one ever that I know looks forward to going door to door, just can't wait. I confessed yesterday when I'm ringing those doorbells, I really don't know if I'm praying they'll be there or not be there. And yet every single time we come back so happy, so thankful that we went, we start compiling Three teams yesterday, small number, 45 minutes or so once we got to our assignments. We knocked on 30 doors. We prayed with 11 different people. We shared the gospel with five different people. We found people. God just puts you in places you can't even imagine. Grace and I knocked on the door. Uh, the husband arrived a couple of weeks ago to work at the labs. His wife literally arrived 12 hours the night before we rang the doorbell. Saturday morning, 10.30, just in case you're wondering, it wasn't 8. But, but only God can put you there with lost people who have just moved in three doors down from the church 12 hours after they move in. But here's the point. Trying to talk to people about whether they know Christ as their Savior. We have a strong Catholic contingency, obviously, here in Albuquerque, but it's not just Catholics, it's all Americans these days. You want to talk about, do you know Christ? And the answer is about works of the law. The answer is about religious activities. The answer is about religious things that we do, thinking that somehow we could be right with God by what we do. And Paul says, give up. No hope whatsoever. But Paul says here in Verse 11, he's quoting, stringing together several quotes and paraphrases from the Old Testament. Even in verse 11, he's quoting from Habakkuk, and he says, the righteous man shall live by faith. You see, he's going to tell us today again that even from the beginning, it was faith. What saved Moses? What saved Abraham? What saved David? What saved uh, Sarah? What saved all of the folks in the Old Testament who are in heaven? Faith even though it looked a little different than it does for us. It's utterly impossible. But he goes on. The second thing that I believe Paul would say to me and to you is that Christ, of course, is the only solution. In these next two verses, verse 13 and 14, there are three amazing truths in verse 13, at least. The first is this. Christ redeemed us. Christ redeemed us. He created me. He created you. 
And even as a child, if you weren't raised in a Christian home, he put his moral law in us. We still knew that there was a right and a wrong. We looked at the heavens to decide whether we believed that there was a creator or all this happened by chance. We, we still knew enough, and many of us knew way too much, that after he created us, we defied him. That we spat in his face, if you will. And then he still left the glories of heaven to come to this earth, to die in my place, to die in your place, to redeem us. That's an amazing truth. But he says he redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. And again, he quotes from the Old Testament, for cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So God created the law that cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. And then God left heaven to come to the earth to pay the penalty, to take the curse on himself. He became the curse for me to pay for the curse that he declared. That's amazing. And there's there's no other false god in the whole world who's ever done anything like this, because they're false gods, of course. But the third amazing truth in verse 13 is the word having become there, that verb is in the Greek. It's in the middle voice. It's a, a, a voice, a, a tense that we have in Greek, and it's, it's, it emphasizes the, the doing it of oneself. In other words, we're reminded here again that Christ wasn't a helpless victim nailed to the cross, that it was from his own initiative that he chose to allow the evil will of mankind to take him to the cross. He went there because he wanted to for me and for you. And so he took the curse on himself. But then in verse 14, he says, in order that Christ Jesus, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. We looked at this before. The promise to Abraham that he would, through Abraham, this, this old man who's 85 at the time of the first promise, that through this man who's beyond the age of bearing children and his wife as well, that he would make a great nation and then that through him and through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So it's Christ that enters the picture to make it so that those of us who are Gentiles, those of us who are not uh, Israelites, might receive that blessing. So Christ enters as the conduit to take that blessing and apply it to all of us. It's an amazing thing. So the promise is made to Abraham and his descendants. And then as the scripture says elsewhere, we are grafted in. Oh, their promises still remain and we look forward to that revival. Uh, We were talking about this at breakfast today. If the temporary hardening of Israel, the scripture says, is glorious, how much more will their return be? There'll be a day when it will be unbelievable when there'll be this revival in the end times of Israel, but we are grafted in through him. But then the bulk of the text before us today is number three. Why the law? So that we cannot miss faith. Verse 15. Okay, Paul says, let's stop and talk here. Brethren, I want to talk to you, it says, in human relations. He says, you know about covenants and and, and contracts and agreements between two parties. Think in terms of someone's will, their last will and testament. He says, after it's been ratified, after it's been signed and sealed and settled, you you can't set it aside or add to it. You, You know, people want to sometimes. Wherever there's a will, there are many relatives, uh, right, uh, who who sometimes, and if you're in a family, parenthetically, if you're in a family who's lost loved ones and you have gone through that with peace and harmony, thank the Lord for that. Oh, I'm so thankful uh, to to have gone through things that way. But there are people who say, you know, no, I want to change that. You can't change it. They they already uh, signed it, had it uh, notarized, and they've, they've died. And so, no, you can't change your loved one's will now. So he says it's the same thing. You can't change it. And in verse 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He said, not to seeds. So there's a couple of things happening here. Number one, he's saying that the promise, again, going back to the last verse, because of Christ, the promise to Abraham is to one group of people. And Jesus, again, has made it. He's, he's taken down the dividing wall, the scripture says elsewhere, between uh, Jew and Gentile, so that by faith we might all have the spiritual promise 
benefits of that promise, but what he's saying in a deeper way here, he goes on, he says, what I'm saying is the promise was really about Christ. Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of the nation that God built through Abraham because he was the ultimate descendant who would bring all of these promises to be true. And so he says it's through Christ. So he's he's still building the background for the law here. He's saying, you understand, there was an agreement. The promise was to Abraham. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of that. Verse 17, what I'm saying is this, Paul says, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. He says, folks, you want to point back to Abraham, and they did. Abraham was, I mean, that was, you wanted to, you know, throw a, a name in there, use Abraham's name for good reasons. He says, folks, Abraham only lived to be 175 years old. The law came 430 years after the promise. It's impossible that Abraham was made right by the law. It didn't exist. He says it was a promise. And Abraham was saved by his faith. Now, did Abraham know everything about Jesus yet? No. But everything he knew about God and his promises, he obeyed in faith. Now, if you figure exactly how that works out, let me, actually don't let me know because I don't think I can take it. The smoke would set off the alarm, me trying to figure it out. But Abraham was saved by faith. He believed everything he knew about what God was saying. And the ultimate faith he had was in the Jesus who would come. So he says, you can't, you can't go back now and say Abraham kept the law. There was no law. It, it, it just doesn't make sense. For if the inheritance, he says in verse 18, is based on law, it's no longer based on a promise. In other words, why would Jesus come if you could get there by the law? We think these things, but we have to stop and realize that it's happening in our head. I'm beginning to think that I can do what would mean Jesus didn't need to come. And we know from the rest of the scripture that, yeah, we need to follow Jesus, that there are results when you take all of this and put it inside of us. But all of that we do is not to gain our justification. It's all because of what Jesus did to make us just before him. He says, it was a promise to Abraham. And he goes on. Okay, he says, I built a little foundation here. Then why the law? Jesus says in Matthew 18, not one jot or tittle, not one stroke, not one dotting of the eye, we might say, will pass away from the law. It remains. It's good. But why then do we need it? And verse 19, odd phrase here, he says, it was added because of transgressions. I believe what Paul means here, it was added to make clear our transgression. The law is like a magnifying glass. The law is like a floodlight to show. Because the very worst thing that could ever happen to you, the very worst thing that could ever happen to me, is that we would live our whole life somehow missing the fact that we fail in comparison to God's holiness and to God's law. And so the law is given, he says, because of transgressions, to be a floodlight, to be a magnifying glass, to show me, to show you that we need somebody to pay for our sin. Why the law? Because of transgressions having been ordained, and this is a confusing phrase, by angels, uh, through angels, by the agency of a mediator. We don't know what the angels part means, what the angels were doing there with God and, and, uh, and Moses, or whether it was what they believed. So Paul's starting where, where they're at, so don't get hung up there on that. But, but he says, by the agency of a mediator until the seed, Jesus, would come to whom the promise had been made and through whom the promise was made. But he says, now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. In other words, he says, uh, the the mediator of Moses and the law is different than the promise with Abraham, because it was just God and Abraham. There was no mediator with the promise, though there was a mediator in the covenant. There was the old covenant, we call it the Old Testament, and the new covenant, we call it the New Testament. And so, God made covenant through Moses, with the law, with his people, It was a lousy covenant for God because he was dealing with people who were like us. Uh, But God made the covenant, and even that covenant that we're not, he's not talking about the covenant necessarily yet, but even that covenant was still based on God's faithfulness, although there would be consequences, good and bad, 
as Israel followed him and did not follow him. But the spirit is based on nothing but promise. <clears throat> if you're confused, man, you're right with me, okay? <laughs> is the law, verse 21, then contrary to the promises of God? And he says, may it never be. Your version may say, perish the thought. Paul says, oh, you've got to be kidding me. No, no, no. The law's not contrary. They're, they're working in tandem together. May it never be, for if a law had been given which was able to impart life, righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. Again, we wouldn't need Christ. If we could do it, if we could get there on our own, and then we get into the meat here that I want to camp out on these next few verses. But the Scripture has shut up everyone under sin. Now, the, the, the word here, to shut up, means to, you know, to encapsulate, to trap. But I just always think it's kind of interesting uh, there because it's also true that the Scripture would cause us to shut up. That when I begin to tell God or me or anybody else how great I am and what a fine Christian I am with my nice blue suit and, and all this, the Scripture would say, hey, why don't you just shut up? Yeah, God's at work in you. God's declared you just because of your faith in what Christ did. God's at work in you now because you do belong to God, and he does see you as righteous because of what he did. And so now he's working out and helping you to grow and following after him. But uh, no, won't you stop before it's too late here? The scripture has cornered us, captured us, so that everywhere we turn, we see that we have failed. If we haven't come to know Christ as Savior yet, if you haven't come to know Christ as Savior, the design of the law, of the Scripture, of the Word of God, uh, Old and New Testament, is to just be in your face everywhere you go so that you have nowhere to run except to one place. The Scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus might be given to who? To those who believe and again, this is one of the many, many reasons I believe that Christ died so that all who would come to faith in him could. I believe that he wants all to come to faith in him or else if it's just a done deal and we're robots and have no choice in the matter, why would the scripture need to shut us up under sin so that we would see our sin? Verse 23, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being, there it is again, shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. And therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Your version may say schoolmaster. Wealthy families in the first century, and, and, and not just the first century, but wealthy families in Rome had a servant whose job was to make sure that the young people, specifically boys from age six to 16, but to specifically assign to make sure those kids got their schooling. Oftentimes that meant making sure that they went from the home to the school and back. But it was their job to escort, to accompany, to make sure that they got there. And so he says that's what the law does. The law is our tutor, our schoolmaster to take us to Christ. So that before you come to know Christ as Savior, the Word of God is there to say, you have got to get to Jesus. You've got to get there. And without the law, you might be tempted to think you can get there on your own. Without an understanding of the scripture, you'd begin to think, you know, I'm pretty good. I watch the news at night, and on the news, I see bad people, and I'm better than those bad people. I'm reading through right now. I, this is my year for reading through the scripture. I try to do it every other year, these last several years, and, and the other years read more slowly. But I'm reading through the law. And, you know, you read through the law, and then there's just some days that you're thinking, man, oh, man, this is detailed. You know, and you're like, oh, I'm beginning to think I have leprosy. There's so many chapters <laughs> on leprosy, right? I mean, you know, if there's, you know, the white fuzz on the wall, and we're going mean, to, it's, it's, you know, it can get a little bit. That's why when I do read through, uh, a little tip for you, I read the old and the new simultaneously every day, because sometimes the new will get me out of leprosy uh, there for a while. 
I probably shouldn't say this from the pulpit, but there's some chapters I, that I read over breakfast, and I'm thinking, I wish I wasn't reading this over breakfast. But uh, anyway, that's, I better get back on my notes. That's kind of the, <laughs> anyway. But why such detail? Because friends, we can't get there. But don't quit reading the Old Testament. Oh, you need the Old Testament to have a deeper appreciation for that new covenant. But here's a little beauty in here in the New Test in the Old Testament for you. If you read reading through the law right now, look for those little those little nuggets of the day, reading through the leprosy, one of the leprosy chapters. And get to the very end. And the man who has leprosy has to abide alone outside the camp, which was a, a miserable horrible, despicable existence for an Israelite to be declared unclean. And then my mind, of course, goes over to Hebrews where it says that Jesus died for me outside the camp. Jesus, an Israelite who understood what it meant to be outside the camp, was willing to go out there for me and for you to die. And so the law reminds me and the law reminds you that there's a God who loves you so much. No matter what you've done in the past, no matter what you'll do in the future, that if you'll turn, and it doesn't make sense, it's not right, it, it's not equal, but if you'll just turn in faith to Jesus and say, I don't know why you'd do it, but if you love me that much that you'd come to the earth, that you'd die in my place on the cross, when even as much as I know about what I should have been doing, you still died in my place. Would you forgive me and be my Lord and my Savior? And he will say yes. You, he says, had a tutor in the law to lead you to Christ so that you may be justified by faith. But now, verse 25, that the faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. It's as if God loved you so much and God loved me so much that he said, the last thing I'd want them to do is to miss the fact that they've got to have a savior. And so I'm gonna give them the law. Oh, the law is, is about more. It gives us just the utter glory of God. It gives us the wisdom of God. But its overarching purpose, Paul says, is to take you to Christ. Where are you today? Have you come to know Christ as your savior? Those of you in this room, those watching online, are you still trusting that because you're a pretty good person, you're going to go to heaven? That's why we still exist as a church, to get the gospel to people. Yes, to tell them how much God loves them, but to make sure we in that explanation that they know why. Why do you need Jesus? You're already pretty good. But no, you need Jesus because you'll never get there without him. Where are you today? There are some in this room that you'd need to say, you know what, I'm, I've been religious all my life, but I've never come to know Christ as my Savior. I've never been willing to humble myself and say, I need a Savior. Well, friend, this is the place to do it because the overwhelming majority in this room have done that, and they're going to be thrilled when you do it. So don't let the devil lie to you and say, I really shouldn't, I really shouldn't do that. I really shouldn't let that be known. Everybody else who has already done that, they've been where you're at, and they can't wait for you to do it. So do it now. This is the room to do it in. Today, we'll pray, and you come. and Take a pastor by the hand, and we'll be thrilled to show you how you can come to know Christ. And then for those of us who are, who are believers, again, Paul says, quit trusting in how good you are. Yes, follow God. Yes, seek after God's ways. Yes, let him sanctify you and grow you. But don't think that you're doing it by your own strength. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to me today, your word to us. Lord, there are those in this room who need today desperately to come to know Christ as their Savior. Oh God, move in their hearts today. Help them to have the wisdom to come and say, I need Jesus. I don't want to wait any longer. I don't want to risk what might happen if I died without him. Those online worshiping today, Lord, that they would pause, those who don't know you, in their living room, in their car, wherever they are, that they'd just pause and just voice a prayer to you that says, I admit it, I have sinned against you, and I need a Savior. And I'm so thankful that Jesus came so that I could have the promise that's based on nothing 
but God's faithfulness through Christ and the cross and the resurrection. And then God, for all of us again today, might we just pause and say, oh God, I didn't do this. You did it and you're at work in me. And that we could just have grateful hearts again and sing praise to your name with all of our heart that you were willing to die for us outside the camp. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.